to you. So, um, I know some of your names, not all. I'm not going to go into a little de into very much detail about what we do, but I'm just going to give you a couple quick points on what we're trying to do. We're here to do the public health end of things, so we really rely, of course, on groups like this to take us back to their communities and educate people. But what we're trying to do, specifically in Washington County, is actually provide some public health uh, response information and actual services, and we're working with groups and people like Rebecca to actually bring these materials out to, to you and educate people on the health impacts. That said, we don't do a lot with policy because we're all consumed by the public health and that health and all of this. Um, so what I'm going to show you today, and I'm going to try and go through this as quickly as I can so I can field questions, this is actually a model that's ready to go. So it's up and running, it's on our website. We want these resources to go out to community members and to start to educate people on basically how to reduce their exposures to things like compressor stations, that's probably the biggest, uh, worst actor, apart from maybe processing facilities. Does everybody here know what a processing facility means? We do not know what a processing facility means. Okay, so a processing facility is actually a cryogenic or some type of facility that's actually removing the chemicals from the gas, separating them out, and so, and they will actually sell, this happens more in wet gas areas, but they'll actually sell those chemicals off as feedstock for like the plastics industry, and there's actually more pollution associated with the processing facility even than the pressure station. Um, that said, the model that we've created works for processing facilities, it works for compressor stations, it works for flaring. We can actually adopt this model or adapt this model to any number of different activities given reliable data, which is not always easy to come by for certain activities. Um, but we can do that for you. It's a lot easier for uh, compressor stations, which is why you'll see this model that I've handed out just today is focused on compressor stations. Um, and so, but that's just one example of what we can do. So we're trying to be you know, adaptive for this. So how's the weather? There's a video actually up to it, and we've incorporated some of the images from the video. But what this is, is this is a training tool. This is a module that can actually be handed off to any number of groups. And we could do a train the trainers. We're hoping to start doing that this fall, in, in, um, at least in southwestern Pennsylvania. And give this information to you as a community leader. And then you can hopefully learn it well enough that you can actually take it back to your group and educate people on this model itself. So that's how you should see this presentation. This is actually a presentation that I could hand to you. And with an appropriate amount of training, we're hoping other people can actually give this presentation. So that's how I want you to look at this. I mean, you're not going to be able to understand all of this immediately just like that. But we're hoping that this is self-explanatory enough and user-friendly enough that if we provided you with the training, you could actually go out and present this to your community. Um, so again, we're just giving people a little bit of background on air, particulate matter, particle pollution. That's a lot of what you're going to see coming off of diesel. I mean, again, I'm not going to give you guys the background because I feel like the level of expertise in this room is pretty high. Field questions to me either after the presentation, I might just kind of go through this quickly and then take questions. Um, so these are some of the health impact, impacts we're seeing. Um, you know, and this, this, of course, is geared towards air contamination. You could also be concerned about risks of water contamination and that vaporizing and getting air, but primarily this presentation is going to be about air and air impacts. Um, you know, there's a lot of background to this, there's a lot of this stuff is on our website, so this is just sort of kind of skimming the surface. Um, okay, so this is, it's almost, it's almost so obvious to me, but we're not salty, but we're trying to make it just real for people and say, okay, look, you know what the weather looks like. I drove here this morning. I saw all the air visibly <laughs> cooling in the valleys of western Pennsylvania. It was just sitting there. And it sat there and sat there and sat there pretty much almost until I got to stay in college. So guess what? You know what the weather is. You know what the, you know, look at that tree outside. You can see it moving. You can start to get a sense of how much the wind is, is blowing. Even if you don't have any fancy equipment, 
tell where the wind is coming from. You can tell, is it cloudy, is it sunny, is it night, is it day? <laughs> those are things that everybody knows. So what we've done is we've, we've used those and incorporated them into this air exposure model to start to give people a basic understanding of how much pollution is reaching them at any one point in time. It's an estimate, right? It's not going to give people to the tons, you know, the, the micrograms or cubic you know, meters exactly what level of pollution they're experiencing at a point in time, but it's going to give them a pretty good estimate, and it's also going to let them know that at night your air quality is going to be worse. During the day, if it's really super windy and it's totally clear, your air quality is going to be better. Those are some basic principles that we can get people to understand and for them to say, okay, now's a good time for me to maybe be doing an activity outside my house. My health is going to be better than if it's a cloudy day, if it's at night, if I'm just letting all this air from this nearby facility into my house and I'm breathing it in and or I'm doing high levels of activity under certain weather conditions where I might be getting more exposure. So of course we're doing this from, from a health protective standpoint. This is really important educational information that you can start to get out to your community to get them to understand it's not just where the facility is, it's how many facilities, it's where it's located in connection to these homes, and certain people are going to be getting higher exposures, uh, just inevitably. So, so these are just some basic things. Again, this is all in your handout, it's all online. Um, there's a PDF of this PowerPoint now online. You know, where's the, where's the facility? Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more detail than this, but these are the basics, right? So again, if it's sunny, if there's no wind, the pollution's actually going to go up and it's going to disperse. If it's sunny and there's some wind, it's going to blow towards places, but it is still going to rise and disperse. But clouds keep pollution down. So with cloud cover, you're going to get more pollution that's going to stay low and descend upon nearby homes. Um, Again, wind is going to disperse it, but it's also going to move from the source more quickly. And at night is when you have to be particularly conscious of what kind of pollution you may be receiving. Regardless really of whether there's cloud cover or not, it makes a little bit of a difference. But in general, pollution is going to settle at night. And that doesn't necessarily mean you might see a decrease in truck <laughs> traffic, not necessarily. But a compressor station runs 24-7, obviously a processing facility runs 24-7, and they actually increase their activities at night. So you might actually be getting more exposures at night. And so you kind of need to get a sense of what is the facility there you actually doing? And what does that mean for your health? Um, a lot of background data here. This is the guy who came up with the model. Um, this will probably interest some of you to know that this was created for uh, chemical exposures under wartime conditions. So it was, it was a model that was created to actually track how chemical gases were going to affect the troops. Um, so, you know, this guy created this model like probably sometime in the 1950s. Um, this is how we're using it. So we are looking at these three things primarily, and there's a reason for that. First of all, we don't know the pollutants. These are indicators. So if you look at particulate matter, it's an indicator of the presence of other pollution that may be reaching you. Um, formaldehyde is something that also there's some data available for us to track what is being emitted. Same holds true for, for VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, particulate matter is the one that's probably easiest for us to track at a, on a low cost, individualized, ongoing monitoring basis. We have a device called the Dylos, D-Y-L-O-S. The Dylos measures particulate matter, and it gives us a sense, which is not at all what you're probably going to get from DEP, of when a spike occurs. So DEP is going to average things out, you know, over the 24-hour period. They're going to look at, you know, who knows what kind of an average they're going to give you. We're interested in the spikes. So we're interested in knowing when the pollution level shot up and then came down fairly quickly. So realistically, you would probably want four to six hour measurements at most. If you average it out over 24 hours, you're not going to get a clear picture of what your exposure looks like. So that's part of the reason why we use particulate matter. But again, this is all in the charts. 
going through this very quickly, and I'm going to definitely take questions. Um, you know, so we've, we've created this video. We've tried to simplify it as much as possible. So this is a tool we're giving to you. If anybody found this useful, we'd be happy to you know, provide uh, materials that we're actually working on right now, additional training materials, a facilitator's guide. So, you know, just some really basic stuff. Where is the facility located? We make multiple ones, figure that out. How far away is it? Um, in what direction so you know where the wind uh, is? And this, of course, shows you that here's the location itself, and there's multiple facilities. So it may be all around you. Where are they? We can actually help people map the map. Um, what is the weather pattern? What's the weather? So is it day or night? Is it cloudy? Um, Again, we're hoping that our video that we've done is really useful for people to present this to kind of a lay audience and say, heads up, these are the kind of pollution incidents you might be experiencing, say, from across our station. Um, I apologize for going through this so quickly, just information you can about. Take, you, can, you can take your time. Okay, I'm sorry. I yeah. Don't, don't, leave out, yeah, don't leave out anything relevant. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I, I want to take questions. And the last time I gave this presentation, I gave it to an audience. And know as much as this audience does, but um, I had an hour and a half, so that's kind of why I'm, I'm on here to speak right now. Um, okay, so, you know, weather forecasts, anemometer, I can explain all of this, I can, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Um, maybe I should stop for a minute and check in with people, because I am moving really fast, so I apologize for that. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay, you said you did modeling about or VOCs or not? That's, that's coming. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, yes. You started to talk about devices to measure, to monitor. I mean, yes. In particular for Melbourne High and uh, Organic Compound. Yes. Are there devices available for all of those? We are testing those out and we're trying to figure out what works. So far, we're pretty happy with the one that we're using to measure particulate matter, but we're not as happy with what we tried for the VOC. Um, the formaldehyde levels that you'll see in these charts, that's actually data that comes from the DEP. It's the best available data we can have. So in answer to your question in terms of the chemicals, we're still searching for that. Sumer canister, of course, is something that a lot of people will be familiar with. We're not entirely sure what we would recommend at this point in terms of the chemical toxic measurements of devices. How big is the formaldehyde bad? Yeah, and so we've heard about these things. We're kind of trying to figure out, you know, do they work, do they not work? Um, some of it has to do, too, with the lab analysis. So you could get the badge, you could use it, but the lab analysis may or may not show you accurate levels depending on how the lab does the analysis. So we are working really hard, and we're trying to get whatever data we can on whatever research there is out there that will prove to us that any number of devices or any one device really works based on our priorities. When your consumer asks me, what are uh, volatile organic compounds or why should I care about them? What do you tell them? Okay, so that's a good interruption and, and why I probably should be going a little slower. Um, particulate matter, and this, I think this is, some of this is in your handout. There's a lot more about this on our website. So if you start to, give me, drill down, to our website. Um, I can't sometimes. Uh, particulate matter is a carrier. So volatile organic compounds in themselves are problematic. But if you were, for instance, painting, you were doing hobbies, you were using solvents, you'd be getting a pretty strong exposure to yourself. But you know, if somebody else was painting in the house next door, you wouldn't be getting as much VOCs because it's very much a, you know, well, they're volatile, right? They volatilize, so they don't stick around. However, in conjunction with particulate matter, my understanding, I'm not the air quality scientist here, and he's explained this to me exhaustively, it carries it into your lungs, it gets into your bloodstream, and it sticks around. So, you, if you cut VOCs, volatile organic compounds, combined with particulate matter, and that's why we're, we're using particulate monitors, so I'm watching them so closely, is that determines how much of, it's, it's basically, it's a carrier. So while you wouldn't necessarily get the volatile organic compound exposure, when you marry it with the 
particulate matter, you're going to increase your absorption of the VOCs because it's coming to you via the particulate matter and it's actually going to end up in your bloodstream. And of course, from our perspective, that's a concern for your health. Um, so we're a little bit cautious about some of the standards, national air quality standards, ambient air quality standards, because they don't necessarily have the right health protective standards in place. Um, you know, we're still working on kind of figuring out what that looks like, but that's where we're coming from. Do you have any data I, I can see on particular uh, particular matter monitoring? I'm, I'm just curious, because it's a yes. solid, it's not going to move as far as your all the organic chemicals by themselves. Right, but it's a, again, it's a carrier. And there's two types. Look on our website. If you start going through our air cage and you start looking at dilos, you'll see some, a lot of data on dilos. Start to look at some of that and how we are using that. But again, you've got two types. You've got, you've got well, there's two types that are typically measured. There's PM2.5, which is a prime particle, and then there's kind of an ultra fine particle, which is PM0.5. So you can imagine that a quote unquote large particle, PM2.5, is still very small. It's like but PM0.5 is, is super fine, and that's going to be transported even more, and it's also going to be a carrier for these. And it penetrates more deeply into your lungs. So we're actually more concerned about PM0.5 in some <coughs> cases. Unfortunately, there are no air quality standards for PM0.5 because they don't have a good way to measure it. I've <coughs> always been curious how far that goes from the source. Yeah, and that's um, that's a really specific question that I could probably have somebody answer for you if we have time, but we don't really spend much time. You know, those are those are great questions to ask, um, and it, the truth of the matter is, it varies greatly. You know, it's the weather conditions, it's the source, of all that. So. If the VOC is attached itself to particular matter, yes, and then it goes over the ground, if it doesn't go away, it becomes soil. Yes, and we're also kind of, we're, we're definitely thinking about that too. There's a concern about deposition of um, you know, contamination. So again, if you were really, and that's, and that's where you'll find this guidance on our website, you don't want to track the soil into your home, right? And if you were in close proximity, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad tidings, but this, this stuff settles out. And, you know, heaven forbid they're aerating the cabinet pond. And they're just blowing this stuff up in the air. Guess what? It's going to settle out on the soil around. You know, the farther you are away from a facility, the less you're going to experience these type of concentrated contamination events. So, so a natural gas compressor dehydration station would be perfect for that because we have a particular amount of compressor and the VOCs for dehydration. Yeah, presumably. And again, there is zero data, to my knowledge, about that. absorbed up into the atmosphere through water vapors and then rain down on you? I would be a little rain. less concerned about that. I would be more concerned about the actual air bringing it to you, you know, and actually breathing it in. So I would be, I would be less concerned, and I would be more concerned, too, if you felt like you had a pollution incident in your actual water source, your well water, when you shower with it or when you cook with it, of course, that vaporizes, and you're getting a direct exposure there. So I personally, and I'm not a scientist, but I personally would probably state that I think there's going to be less concern associated with a rainfall event. I'm sure there's some amount of concern, but I would say there's going to be less concern about that as opposed to the actual direct air exposure and or if you have well water contamination, your exposure from the air that came off of your well water. Uh, on radioactivity, yes. oh, the, the gas. Um, has there been any measurements of the radioactivity in this gas as opposed to the gas that was mined before that were typically used? Um, you know, there's some level of studies going on, but to my knowledge, no. I don't think there's a clear grasp of, of radioactivity. So, okay. the information maybe took it out of Texas. Let's see real quick that uh, 
uh, USGS, uh, the Geological Survey, they're doing they're doing studies now. They've come out with some preliminary data, but nothing that they can definitively say yes, Marcel Shell has it. Now, uh, Reskin, there is another study out there, Reskinoff, um, which is one you can add to the list if you want. There's a, it's a radon study uh, that shows, you know, of course, industries refuted this and, and things like that and kind of targeted Reskinoff as, as being some crazy scientist, but he's, he's got the credentials. Um, he, did, he did find that there was a higher percentage of radioactive material in Marcel Shell clay as opposed to other shell clays. Um, but I think when the USGS data comes out, that's going to be pretty indisputable one way or the other because um, they're I think they're doing like a longer term thing. And so, do you know when that's coming out? I don't. DEP is also doing a, a, a study on technically enhanced radioactive material which was brought back up to the surface so that'll be ongoing for a year. Uh, I know they're going to do it at waste dumps that are accepting Marcel's waste. Um, I'm not exactly sure where else they will be conducting the study, but that is ongoing. So that is the, I mean, that, and that was my understanding of the status, is that, that the studies have started, but it's not been. But th and that'll just, that'll be on how much radon is in old pipelines that are taken out, or in the, the, the drill cuttings at landfills, things like that, but won't, um, I, I don't know if that's necessary to get to the, the question, whoever else has, uh, about like how much radon right. is in our cell shells, but, um, because they're delivering the gas into our houses now, right. so yep. that's why I'm. Yeah, I mean, I mean there are people who are starting to look at that again, but, but nothing conclusive. That's my knowledge about there yet. Um, okay, so sorry, that's what you know. Again, we're just talking about the air model here. <laughs> this is all very basic stuff, and this is all in your handout or on the presentation online. So um, skip past that. Stability classes. This stuff is, is almost, you know, it's it maybe more than you need to know. It, it certainly might be more than your audience needs to know. But we wanted to provide a really complimentary overview for people and, and repeat things so that people came away with at least a basic understanding of what this means. So this is where I start to get into some of the charts, start to, you know, diagram out, like, for instance, here's the facility. This is what the weather conditions look like. This is how much is descending on this place here, which is only 100 feet away versus, you know, a thousand feet, you can see you're getting much lower levels. And if you're six miles away, you're not really getting a high exposure. But any time you're like a hundred feet to half a mile, we'd be concerned. What are those numbers? These are, um, I'm sorry, I am going a little too fast. But um, this is actually for, um, I think this might be, well, let me go ahead to this. Um, here. Um, so that, I believe, was the PM 2.5. So the MUSCs were doing PM 2.5 and formaldehyde. Let me go back to that again. Um, these are typically numbers that you're going to kind of see, and this would be, I'm guessing this is particulate matter. So background levels of particulate matter might be typically around 2,000, right? So when you start to see a reading like 6,600, Sometimes, if you were cooking in your house, you were brewing a steak, your particulate matter might spike temporarily. It might go as high as, as this. But say this is 2 in the morning. You know, there's no reason why you should be getting that kind of a particulate matter reading. Um, you know, and, and these are somewhat more acceptable limits. But see, what we've done is we've modeled this out, you know, for particulate matter, um, for VOCs, and formaldehyde. I'm sorry I'm going through this so fast, but you're just kind of getting a sense of the numbers that here don't matter as much. What we're trying to show in this illustration is just, you know, here's the cloud cover, the pollution is coming up, it's not falling as much on this closed-in location. Are they, um, are they on the site? Yes. Okay. Thank right. You. This whole presentation is on our website, okay. so you can go through this in more detail. Sorry. Um, yeah, and I, I apologize, these are a little hard to see sometimes. But this is what we're doing, right? So, so what we're trying to do, again, is we're trying to give people health protective advice. So uh, again, I'm sorry if you can't read this, but it's in the handout. And what we've done is we've color-coded <laughs> um, color our charts so that people more at a glance can start to look and say, OK, I'm in the red zone. And I'm in the red zone 95% of the time. Maybe I don't want to live in this area, 
or gosh, this is purple, it's very unhealthy. But it's only very unhealthy for me on one certain weather condition, and that's only, you know. So basically what we're trying to give people is some general guidance to kind of make determinations about how safe they are and when they should reduce their activity versus, you know, gosh, I'm in a really unhealthy condition and it's almost all the time. Now this is where it gets really hard to read, and that's exactly why you have the handout in front of you. So this chart is in front of you. But even without seeing the numbers, look at this chart and tell me who is in danger here. I mean, clearly this person living 100 feet from a facility is, purple's bad. I mean, we, we should have come up with a better color coding system, but red's bad and purple's really bad. So, you know, this person has no, healthy options here. Whereas this person who's six miles out, it's all green. You know, so this gives you a really basic indicator of what's happening to you from just one facility, mind you. So this is not all the other facilities that you may be getting exposed to. This is just one facility. This person who's 100 yards away is never experiencing healthy air. Um, so this is, this is from a compressor station. This is 2.5, and as scary as this might look to people, I have bad news. Um, a processing facility is like purple, 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 purple. It's it's really significantly worse than a compressor station. How far out? Um, I just moved away as far as I can possibly get away from the processing facility. I was four miles away from it. But that's just me because I'm hyper vigilant now. I would say if you were two miles away, you'd be getting some level of exposure. If you were three miles away, you'd probably be in better shape. But again, it depends on what direction the wind, really the winds are. Um, you, I just, you know, I, I certainly encourage people to keep as far away from these things as they possibly could. I wouldn't recommend anybody living within a mile to a mile and a half of some of these facilities downwind. Yeah, with the uh, examples that are everybody in this room knows about in Pennsylvania so far, uh, given all the zoning regulations in all the many municipalities we have, what is the typical setback requirement that anybody has seen for, the, for a processing station or a compressor station? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nothing. It's five hundred, three hundred, yeah. Wow. So it's, it's not all That's good. it. That's all we have. Um, you know, we're trying to do this, and, and bear in mind that what we're trying to do is present materials to community members so that, for instance, if somebody lived four miles away from a compressor station, they could start, get, start to get a sense that if it was just one compressor station and they weren't getting a lot of prevailing winds, their exposures would be minimal. If they were three miles away, they're still looking at fairly good circumstances. But if there's multiple facilities around them and they're down slope, that's another picture entirely, and they have to magnify their impacts. This is the best available data we have. You know, first of all, we should be having access to better data. So if anybody ever comes out to us and says, your data is bogus, we're going to say, they give us better data. Because that's not our problem. Our problem is that we found the best data we could PAD, EP data, and it, it, you're telling us it's not sufficient, not our problem. You tell us what the right data is. Okay, I'm not going to ask a nice question. All right. Okay, so that's fine. Industry bullshit. Best business practices. We right. put all the filters on our stations. We're giving you the best, the best of everything. This is still the statistics for that? You know, I couldn't necessarily answer that question. This is, again, this is the data. That's this a, is that the is data. there right now. This is generalized data for a compressor station based on PAD, EP readings, right? So what okay, we've done so is, you know, we've taken the data and yeah, you know. This is what it is. It's still a problem. I mean, you know, I would like them to say, I would love for them to say, to come back to us and say, no, absolutely not. It's all green all the time. I would say, prove it to us, show us the data, we'll accept that. But at this point in time, we don't have that work. Up in New York, where I'm from, the Hancock Convention Station, being built less than 1,000 feet from an organic farm where a lady oh. is raising, is producing honey 
from 700 beehives. Oh, um, dear God. Does she need to be worried? <laughs> 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 she